Hey everyone, let's talk polarization. So, when light comes to us from the sun, it's said to be unpolarized. Here's what that means. Um, polarization is just the direction that electric field is oscillating back and forth and back and forth. So if light is unpolarized, it means that the rays sent to us from the sun have electric fields kind of oscillating in random directions, um, which sort of makes sense. Um, of course, it's got to be perpendicular to the motion of the wave, as it always is. But it could be up and down, could be side to side, could be somehow diagonally, as it travels from the sun to earth. Now, if light is polarized, then it just propagates in a single plane. Um, so, for example, up or down, or right or left, or something like that. So, if something is said to be vertically polarized, that means that all of the electric field making up that light ray is vertically oscillating up, down, up, down, up, down. So convention states it's the electric field, not the magnetic field, when we talk about the orientation of the polarization. You can kind of think of polarizers. These are little devices that take unpolarized light, um, or light that's polarized in a slightly different orientation, and only allow through the light that will be polarized in the way that the polarizer dictates. The way I like to think of it is a metal plate with a slit in the middle of it and a string, like a wave on a string. If I try to send a horizontal wave through a vertical slit, um, or sorry, a wave that's oscillating horizontally through a vertical slit, then none of it is going to get through. You end up with no wave after the slit. If I send a vertical wave, so it's oscillating up and down, through a vertical slit, then the slit does nothing to the wave. It allows it to just continue to pass through. And if I'm at some kind of tilted angle, sort of diagonally oscillating it, um, then when it hits the slit, it'll dampen some of that motion and allow through only the component of the wave that's moving up and down. And that's the purpose of polarizers. So it's called a transmission axis, uh, the, the direction of light that it will allow through. And if light even has a component uh, aligning with the transmission axis, it'll be that component that's allowed through. So think of it like vectors. If I've got light oscillating, let's say, um, to the right, up and to the right, or down and to the left, back and forth like that, and I try to send it through a vertical polarizer, then all I'll do is look at the vertical component of that motion. And that's the component that will uh, be allowed through. So it affects the light intensity. Now, I'm not going to go too much into raw light intensity as it is, um, just what percentage of it is allowed through before versus after. Um, if you get unpolarized light arriving at a polarizer, you get half the intensity afterwards, which kind of makes sense. With unpolarized light, sometimes I'll get horizontal, sometimes I'll get vertical, sometimes I'll get any combination in between. And if I'm only allowing in the, the vertical, for example, then that's about half of the random light that comes through. But if polarized light arrives at a polarizer, um, then it involves the angle between the direction of the polarization of light before it goes through and the direction of the transmission axis. Um, so I, the intensity afterwards, will equal the intensity before times the square of the cosine of theta, where theta is the angle between the polarization direction and that transmission axis. Now, how it comes into practical use. Light from the sun is, again, uh, generally unpolarized as it travels through space. Now, when it gets scattered by the atmosphere, the light gets partially polarized. Um, it gets even more so if it bounces off of a roadway or uh, water, then it becomes partially polarized. The purpose of polarized sunglasses is to block this glare, this reflection, off of water and roadways. Um, if you have a polarized set of sunglasses, try this sometime if you're uh, driving down the... Well, no, not if you're driving. If you are a passenger in a car... Um, Look out at a lake that you're passing by and kind of tilt your head left and right and left and right, and you should see glare start to appear and disappear. That's because you're changing the transmission axis of your sunglasses as you rotate it around um, 
as you change the sunglasses orientations themselves, uh, which is, I think it's pretty cool. Actually, even if you look up at the sky, the blue sky, and tilt your head back and forth, you'll see it start to brighten and dim, brighten and dim just a little bit because of that partial polarization of the scattering. Um, or if you look at uh, lots of screens have polarized light that come off of it. Um, so you can kind of move back and forward, back and forward. I actually had a phone a um, couple of years ago that was perfectly linearly polarized. So if I was wearing sunglasses and I held my phone upright, I would just see a black screen, nothing. And if I would turn it horizontal, then I would see all the light. Um, not all phones are like that. A lot of them are just partially, uh, so it'll never block out all of it. It actually made me worried several times as I was staring at my phone. I would hit the on button and I would see nothing. And I would think my phone was dead. And I was very concerned because I just had a full battery. And no, it just turned out I was wearing sunglasses. I needed to either tilt my head or take them off. And the last bit of this video will involve images, um, forming images through lenses and mirrors. So it's produced by either refraction of light or the reflection of light uh, through a lens or a mirror. You can get real or virtual images. Real images are where the light rays actually converge where you see the image. Virtual images are where the light rays don't actually converge there. It's kind of a, a trick of the brain, is how I like to think of it, at least. Um, and we'll talk virtual images in just a little bit. The simplest version is a plane mirror. It's perfectly f uh, flat and smooth, so the reflection angle is exactly the same as the incoming angle, and it forms an image. Um, it appears to me that my image is back behind the wall. If I'm staring at a mirror on a wall, it looks like um, the version of myself that I'm seeing is behind the wall. Um, that's because the light rays bounce off of, let's say, my hair and back to my eyeball. Of course, my eyes are not used to the idea of light either bending or bouncing, so it assumes that the light ray had just traveled straight the entire time, and it forms an image back behind. This would actually be a virtual image because the light rays are not actually converging where this image is formed. Um, in fact, they couldn't. There's a wall there. But my brain believes it does, uh, so that's a virtual image. Now, no matter what type of lens or mirror we're talking about, um, it has something called a principal axis. And this is just an imaginary line that intersects the middle of the lens or mirror, um, and it does so at 90 degrees. If we have a lens or mirror that's somehow bent, it'll have what's called a focal point. This is where all the light rays that are parallel to that principal axis, um, once they pass through the lens or bounce off the mirror, they all converge at a single point, and that's called the focal point. Now with thin lenses, um, this is pretty much the only type we'll talk about. Well, with lenses in general, I would get some refraction when the light first enters and then refraction again uh, when light exits the lens. If it's thin lens, um, then you can basically approximate it to just bending once and it makes it a little bit easier to deal with. When you're trying, uh, this is what's called a ray diagram. Basically, if I take an object uh, and I pick a point on the object, let's just say the top of it for simplicity, there are going to be rays that are going off in all sorts of directions, and it's kind of crazy. Um, but all we need to do is focus on three distinct special rays. The first ray comes off uh, and travels parallel, comes off the object, travels parallel to the principal axis, hits the lens, refracts, goes through the focal point, um, and continues on. Another ray comes off the top of the object, goes through the focal point on the other side of the lens, closer to the object, hits the lens, comes out parallel to the principal axis. And the third goes from the top of the object through the very center of the lens, because of its angle, does not refract, and continues, continues on straight. Where these three rays intersect, 
that's where the image is going to be formed. Now you can find it mathematically as well for lenses or mirrors. Um, let's call S sub O the distance of the object from the lens and S sub I uh, the image's distance from the lens and F is the focal length. You end up with 1 over S O plus 1 over S I equals 1 over F. So if I know the focal length of my lens and I know how far away an object is, I can find exactly where I need to place my viewing screen to get a crisp, clear image. Not only will the image be possibly at a different distance away from the lens or mirror than the object itself, it'll also have a different height, and that's what's called magnification. Magnification is just the image height over the object height, and it just so happens to equal the negative of the image distance over the object distance. With mirrors, it's a bit of a different story. Uh, you've got an object that, uh, let's say I take a, whoops, one of these rays called a principal ray. Parallel to the principal axis, it reflects off the mirror, goes through the focal point on the same side as the object, as the mirror. Um, and I've got another one that goes through the focal point first, comes out parallel to the principal axis. Where these two intersect, that's where an image is formed. Oh, and by the way, that's a real image because the lines are actually intersecting there. Hmm. Now this, as with all parts of physics, gets more complicated when you start thinking about positive numbers versus negative numbers. So here's a quick little breakdown. The object distance is always going to be positive uh, over the scope of this, scope of this course, at least. Uh, it's not always. If you continue to take an optics course, you'll get into more complicated scenarios. Um, the object distance will not be negative, so always keep that positive, at least in this class. The image distance will be positive when it's a real image, that is, the rays are actually converging where the image is, and it'll be negative for a virtual image. For the focal length, um, if I have a converging lens or mirror, it's positive. It is, if it is a diverging lens or mirror, it is negative. And finally, uh, magnification will be positive if the image is upright. It'll be negative if it's inverted. Here's an example of a diverging lens. Um, it is concave rather than the convex version that I showed you of the first thin lens. I've got a principal ray that travels, strikes the lens. Uh, it's parallel to the principal axis, strikes the lens, and it travels up instead of down. Now, again, the human brain likes to backtrack it. It assumes light always travels in a positive or in a straight line. So if you backtrack away, it goes through the focal point, even though it doesn't really. Diverging lenses are crazy. I'd have another ray that, let's say, it would go through, uh, it would basically just go through the focal. So the second ray would be heading to the second focal point except it strikes the lens and it comes out in a straight line um, parallel to the principal axis. Backtracking, it intersects with that first imaginary part of the ray that I drew. And finally, I've got one that just passes straight through the center of the lens. Where these all converge, that's where a virtual image is formed. Virtual images and diverging lenses are ridiculous, but they just follow the exact same equations as converging. So, that is that. See ya.